Michael Tellinger and Acoustic Archaeology. Michael Tellinger is a published author of several books including Slave Species of the Gods and Temples of the African Gods. Through years of research he has uncovered similarities in ancient cultures from across the globe. He theorizes that ancient civilizations used sound to levitate solid objects and possibly build ancient structures. Even if you do not agree with his theories, his research is absolutely compelling and highlights the capability and power of sound. The following video is a highlight from one of his lectures in Toronto in 2012. Enjoy. But what is sound? Can we look at sound? Can we see sound? There are some brilliant guys that, de that developed a thing called the cymoscope in recent years. I forgot to plug this in. Let me just quickly do this. On, on the metal plate and you put sound frequencies through it and what it does, it creates these perfect, beautiful patterns and they change the, the shape of the of the of the shapes that, that were created by the different sound frequencies. That that was introduced to us by um, um, the Claudney figures. No, <laughs> well, Claudney uh, originally, but uh, more recently by I don't know, a complete blank. Excuse me. In in the in the 60s and, and 70s. Hans Jenny from the Hans Jenny, thank you. See. Hans I'm Jenny, the cymatics, and he co he coined the phrase cymatics, and and he and and we would. Many of you will be familiar with it, and it's just really spectacular what sound does, how it, how it turns sound into physical form and shape. And it, if you take it a step further, these guys created um, a thing called a cymoscope that you can, actually, you can actually do a lot more with it. In fact, they've started analyzing the language of dolphins with this thing and re recognize that dolphins have specific words for things that they communicate with. And this you can all do with the cymoscope. So this is what it looks like when you put a human voice into a cymoscope to show you how it manifests physical form and shape. Isn't that beautiful? So every time you speak, every sound you make manifests itself in an ever-growing and expanding bubble that just keeps going and going and affecting all things around you in ways that you can't even imagine. Every word you speak, every sound you make affects everything around you. When you take one of those sound bubbles and you cut it in half, it's a three-dimensional thing, remember, it's not just a flat two-dimensional thing, it goes in all directions. If you take that sound bubble, you cut it in half, what do you get? And there's this beautiful cross-section on the right here. When you look at the cross-section, what do you see? Look at that. Suddenly you start seeing the cross appearing out of the sound bubble and you realize that one of the most commonly used symbols in religion actually emanates out of the sound that comes out of our mouths and if you drill even deeper into that it becomes quite startling and you realize where they got their symbol from the cross in a circle after all sound is the primordial creative source it is the shape of God the 
creator. And I'm talking about God with a big G, not the little ones with the small G that know how to clone things and manipulate them. This is a spectacular discovery. Look at these beautiful spheres, these sound waves, these sound waves that roll away. The, the resonance, the coherence that moves away from that original source in all direction, at the same time connecting everything and affecting everything from that moment that sound is made. You have connected to everything in the universe from that instant. It doesn't take a um, hundred light years for that sound you made to reach anywhere else in the universe. It actually reaches there virtually instantly. And that's based on a whole different understanding of what sound really does. I know it's tough for some physicists to deal with in, in the mainstream physics. And now you realize how accurate these guys were when they carved these crosses in circles and called them Mabona, Lord of Light. They knew stuff we're only recently beginning to rediscover. And you start seeing the Coptic and the pagan crosses. Whoever designed those knew exactly what they were basing it on. They understood all this stuff. And this is why these symbols carry so much energy. Remember that every symbol, every drawing, every image you look at carries energy. It reflects energy. It's not just a symbol or a thing or your signature or whatever. Everything, every image has energy encoded in it. And it's the energy that comes out of it that affects everything around it, including the people that observe it. Sound heals. Here's a beautiful image of these sound waves, this, these coherent waves coming across a human cell, showing you how it affects the surface on that cell and can either cause ease or dis-ease. The principles of resonance are very important in our lives because that is the prime resonance frequency is attributed to everything that exists. Everything has a prime resonance frequency at which it vibrates and resonates like the whole body, like the cells and organs. The cells in the body resonate at around a thousand hertz. Organs like the heart resonate around a hundred hertz. And the whole body resonates between seven and ten hertz. The prime resonant frequency of everything is based on that specific organ. Important to note that seven and ten at which our bodies resonate is very close to the frequency at which Mother Earth or Gaia resonates at. Um, and therefore we need to get into harmonic resonance with Earth so that we are at ease with Mother Earth and not in dis-ease with Mother Earth and therefore cannot become sick. And these things become more and more important as we grow into this knowledge. Herbert Froelich was very important in sharing some of this information, especially coherence. And uh, he says it's generally believed that biological coherence is the means by which the body integrates processes such as growth, injury, repair and defense. But he also believed that sound is always the precursor to electromagneticism. Well, it says so in the first three verses of the Bible. It's the sound of God that created the entire electromagnetic field. The sound. Nothing else. So can this process be reversed so that we can create everything out of sound? If sound is a primordial creative source, we should be able to use sound to do everything. And now it starts to link to my discoveries in South Africa. From this moment on, you can start seeing why I get so excited about the stuff that I've been talking about until now. Otherwise, it would be a little weird. Why is he talking about all this stuff while he should be talking about ancient ruins? Because I discovered that the ancient ruins are sound energy sources. Once again, highlighting how much these ancients knew. They were way ahead of the pack. <laughs> It's so exciting. So, this guy took it to extremes. He, he wired an LED light, light to a, a speaker and found that if you expose the speaker to very noisy areas, it actually reverses the process. The coil, the, the, the speaker vibrates the coil and it says that it sends the energy back and actually lights up the LED lamp. I haven't tested this, but I'm not going to you know, not believe it because it makes sense to me. So, go and try it. We live in an electromagnetic universe where everything spins and vibrates and resonates. It appears out of thin air, out of a point or a vacuum. Magically, it just appears out of nothing. Just like banks create money just out of thin air. Just like our money. 
That's, that's the one thing that they have in common. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> we had a rough day, sorry. <laughs> And it's the spinning and vibrating and resonance that allows us to measure all this stuff in the electromagnetic universe. And then we teach our students that, well, <clears throat> we can only talk about the stuff that we can measure. All the stuff we can't measure, we can't talk about, and, and therefore probably doesn't exist. And that's just the, the most incredible nonsense that we can come up with, isn't it? I'm sure every one of you understands what I'm talking about. It's just insane. So I'm saying just because you can't see it, it doesn't exist. In that case, I can say to you, if you think that if you can't see it, it doesn't exist, you must be a big... I don't know, did you get that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it can make us sick. That's why it doesn't show. So we also told that the universe keeps expanding. And this electromagnetic universe that we find ourselves in, and because it keeps expanding, Common physics tells us, well, if it's expanding, something must be contracting for the universe to expand. And yet quantum physics tells us, well, that's not necessarily necessary anymore. And these two, con these two, two conflicting philosophies are at odds with each other. So who is blowing up the universe if it keeps expanding? What if, what if nothing was blowing up the universe? Those are the fundamentals of quantum physics. That there can be nothing and something gets created out of that nothing. An infinite amount of things get created out of this nothing. And you don't have to have contraction to have expansion. That's an old kind of way of thinking about the nature of reality. We've got to get out of that kind of paradigm. So what if I told you that it is actually us that is blowing up the universe? Not just us, but it's actually our consciousness. The stuff that we find so difficult to define. What is this consciousness that keeps blowing it up? We are the things, we are the people, we are the consciousness that keep blowing up the universe. You don't need something to contract. And that means that God is within us. God is within you. Once again, all the great masters of the past have told us the same story. God is within you. You can do anything if you believe, if you understand. You can move mountains, you can do all these great things. Because you are one with God. God is within you. And guess what? All this knowledge and information has been encoded and kept by, by artists and knowledge and, um, and great minds of the past in such spectacular fashion, but sometimes it gets presented right in front of our eyes and we can't even see it. This is one of the best examples of God is within you. Michelangelo's wonderful drawing, wonderful painting in the Sistine Chapel. The creation of Adam. There's God within your brain. You are the creator. Through your mind you can create. You don't need anything from outside. Look at Adam just doing nothing. <laughs> Very calm. <laughs> and when you start looking at the work of William Shakespeare, um, Leonardo da Vinci, there are hundreds and thousands of encoded works, not just art, not just ancient um, works like, like um, Shakespeare, but modern movies are totally and utterly encoded with all this knowledge and information in ways that will blow your mind. And our, this, obviously this presentation is far too short for that. So go and check out Willem de Swart's work on his website called secretnumbers.org. Secretnumbers.org. And he talks about the movies and how they are encoded with all this advanced knowledge. It is spectacular. Knowingly? I beg your pardon? They've been encoded knowingly? Absolutely. Knowingly. All, and uh, this is a big thing. I'm just going to quickly tell you what I found out because uh, otherwise we're going to spend an hour easily talking about this. We can spend a day talking about this because it so, gets so exciting when you see what's going on. Once you see what's going on, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe it. It's all around us. It's just everywhere and we just can't see it. But when you see it, suddenly you realize what's going on. It's, when you know the truth, when you have seen the light and you know the truth, you have to tell it. You have to share, share it with others. If you don't, it will consume you and it will kill you. Okay, so I'm giving you this bit of advice from me. Go out and tell others. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to die. <laughs> you're going to die in any case. Well, maybe. Maybe some of you are these weird ETs that live forever. But uh, what I found is that if you know this stuff and if you come into the light and you become enlightened, you've got to share that information with others. It's just one of those things. So, I believe that there's an inner secret sanctum of, of the Freemasons, which actually referred to themselves as the Templars. So, 
and they are responsible for this encoding of this advanced knowledge into the movies in Hollywood. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. They have their ways. It is so specific, it is so exact, it is word specific, it's time code specific, it's at 55 minutes and 69 seconds he says X, Y and Z. It is spectacular. And it is the direct link to the tarot cards, the 22 tarot cards and all the archetypes and all the information that is encoded in the tarot cards. That is, that is pretty much all the knowledge of the entire universe and everything that's ever occurred in it. It is mind blowing people. It's just when that stuff starts to hit you and you realize how deep that knowledge is, you just got to ask yourself, who were these people that encoded all this stuff? The tarot cards. Who were those guys that created the tarot cards? They knew everything. And we're just slowly but surely stringing onto this little, you know, little bait and getting more and more um, bigger handle on the bigger picture. So I believe the movies are encoded to help us wake up subconsciously and subliminally, help reactivate our, our consciousness and our DNA and, and other ways. Sound and frequency are the master key. Sound can do everything. All these things. All these amazing things that sound can do. So let's have a first look. First of all, brand new discovery by a German pharmaceutical company that says this. Releases new plasma light that kills bacteria, viruses and fungus. And it can even kill cancer. Wow, isn't that amazing? And they don't tell you there's just frequencies of light, so they have to give it a funky name like plasma light. And it's very, very expensive. And only the richest of the rich with the best hospital plans can afford this because it's plasma light. Don't try it at home. It's not just ordinary light. It's plasma light. Well, guess what? This guy did it a long, long time ago. Royal Rife. Cured all disease with light, sound, electromagnetic frequencies. He had it all worked out. He killed everything you can imagine. Cured people from anything. Unfortunately, he didn't want to work too closely with the pharmaceutical companies. So guess what happened to him? We crush stones, kidney stones, but you know, so we don't have to operate. So take it to the next level. Can we crush bigger stones? If we can crush kidney stones with sound, of course we can. John Keeley, in 1888, crushed 20 ton giant blocks with sound frequencies. He drilled precision holes, absolutely precision holes with sound frequencies. He levitated them with sound. He did all this stuff with sound, and in fact, it's him that gave us a clue that the sound device has to be calibrated to the body frequency of your body. That's why I figured out that those gods in Egypt had to carry the ant that was calibrated to the frequency of their own body. John Keeley gave me that clue in some of his work. And, um, and this was his musical dinosphere that he did all this magical stuff with. Magic. He could do absolutely magic. He was a real magician. And to show you how sound and frequency can burn salt water, you might have seen this. I saw this for the first time about three years ago, and since then I've never heard of this guy again. And that's what happens to these amazing people when they discover things. So what I'd like to suggest to you is if you're holding on to anything, a discovery that can change the world and free the world from the enslavement, put it out there, share it with everybody as quickly as you possibly can. The longer you hold on to it, the more you endanger yourself and your family. Put it on the internet, right? That's Make right DVDs, up. spread it out as widely as possible. So 10 million people know about it in, in, in a matter of 24 hours. Otherwise, you're really not doing yourself a great service. Instead of paying almost four bucks for gas, how would you like to run your car on salt water? Now, it may sound crazy, but wait until you see what a local inventor has come up with that could change the world. And as Channel 3's Michael Barrett tells us, that's not all he's trying to do. Retired TV station owner and broadcast engineer John Kansas was not looking for an answer to the energy crisis. He was looking for a way to cure cancer. Four years ago, inspiration struck in the middle of the night. Why not use radio waves to kill the cancer cells? The best thing that worked at that time was my, that I could find at 3 o'clock in the morning with my wife's spy pants. His wife, Marianne, heard the noise and found her husband inventing a radio frequency generator using her pie pans. I got up immediately and thought he'd lost it. Here are the basics of John's idea. Radio waves will heat certain metals like gold. Tiny bits of that metal are injected into a cancer patient. Those nanoparticles are attracted to the abnormalities of the cancer cell and ignore the healthy cells. The patient is then exposed to radio waves and only the bad cells heat up and die. Killing cancer cells is amazing, but John had also stumbled on yet another amazing breakthrough. You got nothing his machine could actually burn salt water. 
Scott Kansas discovered that his radio frequency generator could release the oxygen and hydrogen from salt water and create an incredibly intense flame. Just like that. That was inside a car cylinder. You could see the amount of fire that would be in the cylinder. I can put my hand in here. Put your hand into the beam, nothing happens. Put in a fluorescent bulb and it lights up immediately. At the APB Company Laboratory in Akron, top engineers have checked out John's amazing invention and they were amazed. And we saw it go up to 1500 degrees centigrade, the temperature, and it, it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. This simple Stirling engine is running with the heat generated by the flames coming off that test tube. The fuel, nothing more than salt water. Uh, that could be a steam engine, uh, a steam turbine. Could be a car if you want it to be. That's the true American innovator. Someone that is not looking for something, he just finds it. This is uh, the most abundant uh, element uh, in the world, water. And salt water is everywhere. And, and to see it burn, uh, actually gives me chills. So we imagine the possibilities. Salt water as the ultimate clean fuel. A happy byproduct of one man searching for a cure for cancer. In Erie, Pennsylvania, Michael Mara, Channel 3 News. Hi. So why are we still driving cars on petrol or gas? I don't know. This is an immediate answer. Quick frequency converter in your engine and bingo, away you go. It's because somebody doesn't want us to. And those somebodies have very, very incredibly powerful influence over our lives and everything we do. Sound boils water. This is my absolute favorite. And by the way, just what the other thing that, that I need to point out as well, what that sound frequency does that, that gets the, um, the water to, to burn, it also lights up the light. Do you notice there? So you could actually run your entire household on that. Boiling, boiling stuff, heating stuff, lighting your house on just the frequency. Um, this is uh, Peter... Davy, a New Zealander who died last year at the age of 94, since 1940 he's been boiling water with sound frequency. The problem is that he's been trying to make millions and millions out of his invention and it was money and his obsession with money that prevented all of us from getting free energy. And it's always money that's in the way, which we're going to get to. But. This guy should have, this is the holy grail for me, you know, how much water do you want to boil? Sound frequency that boils water, resonant harmonic uh, frequency of boiling water. If any of you have the ability to go into a, a, a laboratory and reverse engineer this, just boil some water and re measure the resonant harmonic frequency of that boiling water and that'll probably be the frequency that'll boil it. And you just need to create a device that creates that harmonic resonant standing wave dump it in the water and it should boil it instantly. That's how it should work. That's, so if you can do it, go and do it. And tell everybody if you find it immediately. Because <laughs> you'll hear. This is what you'll find here. They're talking, this, is, this guy has just discovered the, the free energy given the world the Holy Grail. And, and they talk about a gizmo that can make a, ni an, a nice cup of tea. <laughs> it's just... And then they have to bring in some hick professor who has no clue about sound and resonance and has to completely undermine the guy's lifetime achievement, you know. Um, a 92-year-old Christchurch inventor claims to have come up with a novel way to make a cup of tea. He's invented a contraption that he claims uses the power of sound to boil water. Beverly Lockhart went to investigate. It looks like a desk lamp is cool to the touch and appears to be doing nothing until it comes into contact with water. 92-year-old former Spitfire pilot Peter Davy claims his invention uses the power of sound to boil water. Peter, yes, I, uh, I've never been back from that work. Nobody really knows that work. Davy believes high frequency sonic vibrations emitted from within the silver bulb cause the water to boil. He says the idea came to him 50 years ago when he noticed different saxophone notes caused different household items to rattle. The mains powered gizmo has experts intrigued. Never seen anything like it in my life, as they say. Professor Williamson has his doubts about Davy's acoustic theory and suspects there are two simple electrodes inside the boiler. 
surface and conductivity of the water that provides the, the path for the, for the current and provides the resistance to give the heating. I'm careful that I'm not involved everything. I'm working to get a manufacturer and to pay to put some money into it. And if he does get it on the shelves, he's already got one interested customer. If I saw one in a shop, I'd buy one because I, I, I think they're interesting as a bit of technology, however it is they work. They work. But for now, Davy is savouring his gizmo's success and sticking to his own unique theory on how it works. <coughs> Beverly Lockhart, 3 New. Interesting little bit of technology. <laughs> and sound levitates. You've all heard this. Ancient cultures talk about sound levitating and either levitating with their mind, with their thought, or with sound. But until you see it, it's just a thing that you've heard about. So I found this little video clip that's just really important for everybody to see. Because once you've seen it, then you know it really does happen. It's not just somebody talking about it. So what's noted, important to note here is that there are two sources of sound. right? And at the point where they cross over, that's where it seems to levitate, the objects. They're levitating like poly polystyrene objects, which means that this, the, the energy used is very low. Just like things of light, you know easy to lift polystyrene. The higher the frequency, the more the energy. Therefore, if you're going to lift something really heavy, you're going to need higher frequency of energy, and you're going to have to create that high frequency of energy, which means you're not going to hear it. It's going to be beyond your hearing. So when you're lifting something with two sources of sound that cross over, and something is levitating at the crossover point, and you can't hear the frequency, it'll look like magic, right? Because here you're standing with two sources of something in your hands like this and something over there is busy lifting up <laughs> and you can't hear anything no machinery nothing so it's going to look like bloody magic also notice when um, the subtlest smallest change in the frequency in the sound how it makes it spin and vibrate and rotate and dip up and down and then stop spinning. So it shows you that you can manipulate it with the sound. Subtlest changes in the frequencies and you can manipulate it that way. Can you see the sources of sound there? One on the left and one on the right. tell people that you've seen it, not just heard about it. That's really important. You know, I like to operate on that level. Just now I've seen it. I've just haven't just heard about it. It's really important. Sound is free energy. Many ancient, many great recent minds have been telling us this, and I'm going to show you some of this right at the end, how much of this energy sound can generate. Nikola Tesla is one of the most famous ones, obviously, and we should have all been driving cars on his free energy and having sure. lights everywhere and everything should have been running on the Tesla energy. The most important thing that I found he said in his work is that the earth rings like a bell and if you can tap into that sound ringing frequency of the earth you can use it as an infinite source of energy. It's what he did with that sound ringing of the earth that is so amazing. I think this is most likely what he did and many many more people are starting to see the same thing. He used the sound frequency of the earth, he brought it up to the top of the Tesla Tower on Long Island, and that's where he made the magic. That's where he converted it to this other form of energy that everyone's looking for, and could be beamed instantly anywhere in the world, except, to be used. Except you can't put a meter on it. Except you can't put a meter on it, quite right. And that's why 
they Didn't broke it down. That's why it so happen. there's an interesting picture of his tower, if you haven't seen it before. And then on the right, the famous Tesla light bulb, the, the, the wireless light bulb that you just pick up in your hand and it lights up. It picks up the energy from your body and gives you light. In fact, he also had those that you could just walk into the room and it would pick up your energy from your presence near the light. I don't know what you would do if you want to go to sleep, but <laughs> let's not worry about that problem now. And there he is, holding his light. He put it in a box. <laughs> this is how we show our ancient, the ancient civilizations looked. And these primitive people got together and they had a board meeting and they said, what shall we do? to really impress future generations. And one guy at the back end said, hey, let's build really big impressive structures out of big stones that are really difficult to move. That'll really freak out the future generations. They all said, hey, that's a great idea. Let's do that. They'll wonder how we did it. And then they got together and they ropes and pulleys and they built the most important structures in the world in ways that we don't understand. And that's exactly how it happened, right? And uh, I believe that these guys in the past did these things because they could. It was easy for them. The reason why we don't do it today is because it's difficult for us. We don't know how to do it. So clearly they knew a whole lot of stuff that we have no clue about. Just reverse those things, you know, the attitudes about what we think about the ancients. And they got these stones and they molded them together in ways that we just marvel at and go, my goodness, they were so clever. Look at these old people. They were so clever. And then they rounded them and they just knew exactly how to do this. Now you can't do this unless you use some sort of advanced technology like sound frequency to soften them so you can mold them and put them together so they fit. And I've had some really interesting information on this particular trip through the USA and now in Canada of how some of this was done through channeled information and some uh, information that people have shared with me on various stops how this was probably done through past life regression and channeled information and it's spectacular because it falls in perfectly into everything we're discussing here and uh, and it's just really beautiful stuff when these things start to fall into place you can start using the argument of probability from a scientific perspective and that's, I love to do that because it gets those that don't want to believe you really upset because the probability factor is in my favor Resonating, uh, resonating energy devices, that's pretty much what we're looking at. All these ancient structures had very strong relationships to energy and resonance. This is a beautiful picture of an aerial photograph of Stonehenge, obviously. Now, I'm going to very quickly show you how old Stonehenge is. Um, see that one there, lying over there? That's the twin of this one standing up here. It fell over and it broke. And we told, how old is Stonehenge at the moment? What's the average estimate? 2,300 years. Sorry? 2300. 2300 years, okay. I read somewhere that they, that, that, that they now dated it like 7800 BC. And they're really pushing it. Really pushing it. And it's just such nonsense because they just make these things up because, you know, from, I don't know how they, but they do. They make them up and they publish them. So that stone that fell over is the twin of this one standing up. When it fell over, it broke. That's where it broke. I work with stone every day. Every, any one of you that work with stone every day, you'll know what a fresh break in a stone looks like and how long stone takes to erode. This is one of the hardest stones in the world, sarsen stone. When this stone breaks, that erosion there doesn't even look like the same stone anymore. You've got two feet of erosion there, people. On sarsen stone, I'm sorry, the geology does not lie. We're dealing with something that's millions of years old here, not a few thousand years old. The erosion tells us it's very, very simple. This lintel is one of the ones on top. Look at the crack through this lintel. The lintel must have happened after it was put in place. Not before. They wouldn't have built the thing with the crack in the lintel. So the crack occurred after it was put in place. The erosion around the lintel is spectacular. It's about, that's about a 10 centimeter gap in there. Once again, indicating extreme age. The geology will not lie to you. So, you've seen physical evidence. Stonehenge is millions of years old. No, it's just a few thousand years. How that is possible, I don't know. I'm just pointing out the obvious facts to you. Why it's still standing there, I don't know. So next time somebody tells you Stonehenge is a few thousand years old, tell them to take a hike. And not only is it spectacularly old, but this acoustic resonance measurement from Stonehenge tells us that it's very specifically and intelligently built 
you're not going to get these beautiful symmetrical interference patterns from something that is accidental. And we know we're dealing with some advanced knowledge and technology with sound, acoustics, harmonics, and so forth. And the same goes for the Great Pyramids. Carmen Bolter here from Canada, she's a huge proponent of the, the, the pyramids being sound resonating devices for generation of energy. She goes even further, she suggests that, um, that the sound resonance was created from flowing water that used to flow under the pyramid. So the sound source resonance came from water. Isn't that an exciting discovery? From water? Since water is linked to the creation of all things in our solar systems, now it's creating the sound resonance that comes out of the pyramids as well? You get some seriously intelligent power coming out of those pyramids. And um, Christopher Dunn with his study and his keys of power plant theories is spectacular information. What I discovered when I looked at his work is, you know that in one harmonic resonant octave there are 13 notes. Seven whole notes or seven white notes and five black notes, right? And, um, and, the, and uh, if you look at this, and so it's the 12 notes and the 13th note is the end of the octave and the, that, that masks the first note, right? So you've got the five black notes. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five in the king's chamber. What are they connected to? By this stone over here, or this passage that, is, that links them. But I think it is originally probably a stone. I don't know. Look at what it connects it to. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven stones over there. Seven layers and five gives you twelve. This is not by accident, people. I think there's stuff so deeply encoded in this. When you get this thing resonating and it starts to create huge amounts of energy re or resonance, because just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And therefore we use specific technology to see things and find things, like specific lenses on cameras that can capture things that we can't see with our eyes, like specific waves and frequencies that come out the pyramid like this, telling us that there's still something very, very strange coming out of the pyramid. And it's long, long, far away from being dead. Why am I so excited about that is because that's exactly what I find in the stone circles in South Africa. Creating huge amounts of energy. There is a modern day levitation expert and his name is Ed Leeds Skolman who built Coral Castle in Southern Florida. Oh, yes. Single handedly he levitated and moved these giant 10 ton, 20 ton blocks of coral, offloaded them off the truck, piled them on, on heaps and then he carved them. And, and chiseled them and created this amazing place called Coral Castle. And it's, he left it full of clues encoded for us of how he did it. Spectacular swir um, swiveling door that they can't fix. They haven't been able to repair properly in a number of years now, decades actually, I believe. The same story has become a bit of a legend of a story. They just can't fix it. And he did it single-handedly on his own. One day, two schoolboys saw him offloading the giant blocks. They came home and they told their parents, we saw the man offloading the stones. How did he do it, said the parents. And they said, he did it with ice cream cones in his hands. And the parents said, yeah, right, go to bed, you naughty children. You're not getting any ice cream from us. But the children were right. And it's based on that that I call it the ice cream cone phenomenon. And I would not have known this unless this guy on my last year's tour told me about the story. One of the you know, well-kept secrets. And why did I find this exciting? Is because I find ice cream cone shaped tools all over South Africa, always linked to the stone ruins I've discovered. I found dozens of them and photographed probably several dozens of them. What would you be doing with these cone shaped tools? What are they for? They make no sense whatsoever. And they're not just restricted to South Africa, but you also find them in, in museums here in the United States where they commemorate the building of the temples of Suma and these ice cream cone shaped tools were recovered from the walls of the Sumerian temples with, with uh, cuneiform hieroglyphs commemorating the building and the constructing of the temples of Suma. Why would they put it onto ice cream cone shaped tools? Well, you'll figure out why. This is the tool that Edlitz Skalman used for his miracles, for levitation, for everything. Can you spot the similarity between Edlitz Skalman's levitation device and John Saul's energy generating devices, a reconstructed Stonehenge, John Keeley's musical Dinosphere when you take the covers off, 
you realize that that's exactly what they were. All energy generating and levitation devices. Free energy is everywhere, people. The whole universe is one giant ball of free energy. Why are we paying through our noses for electricity? Because electricity is just a form of energy that's been developed so that we can, they can charge for it, so we have to pay for it. Otherwise, we'd have free energy. It. There's free energy everywhere. You all know this. We've got to work towards that and take back that which was taken away from us. And especially in the ancient stone ruins of South Africa, and Southern Africa as I mentioned, sound as a source of energy becomes a very important factor. I'm going to take you through a few of these and then we're going to take a break. First notice, the first thing that, that struck me, it took me nearly two years of looking at them and studying these ruins and fig, trying, walking through thousands of them, trying to scratch my head saying, what is going on here? This doesn't make any sense. What is this stuff for? Remember that all these ruins were, uh, are still classified as, as, as dwellings and cattle kraal built by the migrating tribes for their cattle or for themselves. So most of them are referred to as cattle kraal and living places. And I see how silly that is. And how, what a knee-jerk reaction that is from historians and archaeologists. Like, oh, it's going to be cattle kraal. Well, the walls are this high. Because I'm not going to stop the lions from jumping in there and getting the cattle. Some of the walls are as high as the ceiling, but you know. And they have no doors and entrances. Oh, they used to load the cattle in over the walls. <laughs> and they find narrow, very narrow doorways. And they say, well, these narrow doorways are, oh, they actually had dwarf cattle in those days. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. This is all the stuff they make up and put in our history books. It's spectacular. They'll make up any crap because it has to fit their model. That's right. <laughs> what I found is that probably the most important thing ever until we got to this point was that each and every one of these circles is completely unique. There are no two that are alike. That was a huge, huge psychological breakthrough. Each one is completely and utterly unique. And they have all different shapes and sizes. Some are small, a few meters across, some are 150 meters across. And not one stands alone. All of them are part of a much larger grid. Here, for example, you can see that extent, extension there is what, or what I call the spider's web effect, which is really where it goes into the agricultural terraces. And they just go on and on. I wonder if we can close that. But so you can it. see it still. Nothing stands alone. This here, you can't see when you're on the ground. So you can't see that there's a horseshoe shape effect there with a circle in the middle and a stone right in the middle of a circle. And this is clearly not something that happens by accident. Also, a very important thing to note is that the stuff around the circles that lies hidden below, below the soil. There is so much around it because they are all connected. Nothing stands alone. But the stuff in between lies buried beneath the soil. There's another horseshoe shape in the middle of the forestry area. Here you can see how this one is connected to that one. Look at all the stuff hidden below the soil here. Mm -hmm. You can see it. It's just exactly at, this, as, at the time this picture was taken. Otherwise, other parts of the day you don't even know that it's there. In fact, you walk there. I've walked up here many times. You walk here, you have no idea that when you're walking there, you're walking on these hidden terraces, uh, these hidden circles. It's only when I saw this photograph, I went, oh my God, look at this. It's amazing. And then they build beautiful flower shapes, because flowers are pretty, right? No, you can only see them from the sky. And they're all connected by these stone channels, two walled channels, Connecting to this one, there was a channel here, and then it goes into what was a bigger channel here, which is badly eroded by now. All connected, nothing stands alone, but these flower-shaped patterns become very, very important in understanding what these people were doing. How many of these ruins are there? This is the spectacular discovery that completely blows everything we've ever read in any history book out the window. In 1891, Theodore Benn, from horseback, while he was excavating Southern Africa and the first guy to truly excavate Great Zimbabwe, wrote that he believes that there are at least 4,000 of these stone structures. Now I need to put this into perspective. Southern Africa is always written about as a sparsely populated part of the world. Only a few thousand people existed there, like 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Only a handful of people lived there. So Theodore Ben says there, 
more than 4,000 of these stone structures from horseback. Roger Summers in 1974 did a calculation where he presents 20,000 stone circles. 20,000. Now we're starting to get into some dangerous territory. The population is very, very thin on the ground to make 20,000 structures. Then I got involved in 2007, and within six months I've estimated there were at least 100,000 of these. And I thought, okay, no one's going to buy this. 100,000 stone structures, forget it. In a sparsely populated part of the world, so I started counting them to try and get some sort of semblance of, of support. And I broke up the Google photographs and the aerial photographs into 100 square meters to 1,000, 10,000 square meters, and I got averages of circles. And eventually I averaged at 3.62 circles per hectare per 10,000 square meters, which is not a lot. And then I extrapolated those to three main areas, in South, two in South Africa, one in Zimbabwe. Those aren't the only areas. There are other large clusters of these stone structures. But I only use those three. And I, just to show you some of the areas, this is all over South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and I'm finding more and more and more as we go. Sometimes they look like this. This is an aerial photograph. And, and you've got to start, your eyes have to start to become sensitized and recognize these things. And once you see one circle, you start seeing, oh, there's many more. This is in the free state in South Africa. Notice the stuff in between, the obvious circles here. All the stuff hidden by soil, glass covered beneath the soil. There's a large one on top of the mountain. And just the other day while I was looking at it, I noticed all the stuff here um, that's happening there. There's a huge amount of activity there. Some of them are really complex and very strange shapes. And this is just south of Johannesburg. People there, thousands of these that cover the hills south of Johannesburg. Thousands. Imagine if you had thousands of these ruins in the hills around uh, Toronto and nobody was paying attention to them. It's just insane. <laughs> and this is the other side of Rustenburg where I grew up, where the platinum mines are. This is closer to Botswana. Look at the density of this stuff. This runs for about 5 by 5 kilometers, as dense as this. This is just another aerial view close to where I live in Waterfall Burfen. About three hours out of Johannesburg towards Mozambique. And by the time I finished counting all these, it wasn't 4,000 or 20,000 or even 100,000, but I found there were more than 10 million of these stone runs. And that changes everything in a split second. You know that you're dealing with a vanished civilization that we know absolutely nothing about. This was a shock to the system. And I knew that I'd stumbled upon something a lot bigger than anyone could possibly imagine. As you can see, all of them are connected. That's what it looks like. Pretty much most of Southern Africa and large parts of it. What's so special about these ruins? This is Your Highness' important work. Most of them, all the ones that he looked at, are aligned with the cardinal alignments, north, south, east, west, which incidentally reads news, right? North, south, east, west, north, east, <coughs> south, west. And sacred geometry. These guys didn't just build them, they knew exactly what they were doing. When you start seeing sacred geometry and five factor elements coming to life in these rooms, you know that they knew very specific plans for these and hexagons appear in them. They were clearly doing something we don't quite yet understand, coming to grips with. And this is just beautiful when you take the, this equilateral triangle that comes out beautifully. If you take that flat portion of the ruin and you extrapolate that into the circle that's loosely laid over it, it gives you a perfect hexagon to connect the opposing corners of the hexagon, you get an equilateral triangle that touches the inside circle perfectly. When you create the, when you finish it, you get a perfect started rehaven. We hope you enjoyed this video and for more lessons and videos go to freakphysics.com.